Hello, this is Dr. Marty Klein. Today I'd like to talk about consent. Complicated issue, right? The issue of consent and the term consent culture have become very influential in sex education, sex therapy, and psychotherapy. And that's a problem. Now, if by consent you mean sexually, people should only do what they really want to do, and no one should be forced to do anything they don't want to, well, of course, that's a good thing. It's a very important thing. Conversely, a quid pro quo demand, have sex with me or you lose your job, now that's a power play between unequal parties that offers very little choice, and so that's a bad thing. But for some officials and commentators, consent is a cover for the same old anti-sex stereotypes, that male sexuality is by nature exploitative, that women need special protection from men and sex, that enhancing sexual pleasure and intimacy is much less important than preventing danger, and that feeling pressured or heartbroken is so traumatic that it must be eliminated from dating. Now, explicit consent can contribute to pleasure and intimacy, of course, but trying to eliminate coyness, seduction, encouragement, flattery, or even manipulation from dating is not only unrealistic, it's unwise, it's unwanted, and it's contrary to human experience. That's because the erotic dance between any two people invariably involves ambiguity, ambivalence, multiple agendas for each person, incomplete communication, and an ever-changing context. And this is fully as true for women as it is for men. And that doesn't even begin to factor in alcohol or the way that some people reinterpret their experience of the previous night in the face of daylight sobriety or their friends or therapist disapproval. And America still has not resolved this question. When a man and a woman are both too drunk to legally consent and both want to have sex, why is the man responsible for preventing the sex, but the woman isn't? The recent advocacy of consent culture as the most important part of sex continues to distract us from other equally important issues in sexuality and public policy. Here are just some of the contemporary realities that are just as important as consent. For example, the reversal of evidence-based sex education in schools. The American government now funds only organizations promoting abstinence-only approaches to sex education. For 30 years, research has consistently found that these programs are ineffective and sometimes even dangerous. Only half of American teens receive school instruction about contraception before they have sex for the first time. Meanwhile, people of all ideologies decry the role that pornography plays in educating young people about sexuality, an absolutely legitimate concern which I share, and that makes accurate and relevant school sex education an urgent policy matter. Then we have fetal personhood laws. Pregnant women across the country are increasingly subjected to laws that place the welfare of their fetus above their own. American women have been arrested after accidentally falling downstairs, taking drugs prescribed by their physician, being in a car accident, and having a stillborn delivery. When a woman's life is secondary to the fetuses, and legislators take the bizarre position that the fetus needs a protector, who's going to protect the woman carrying the fetus? And by the way, these are the same legislators, of course, who deny funding for pregnant women's health care services. There's also the explosion in the number of people on sex offender registries. Every state is now required to maintain a sex offender registry accessible to the public. There are almost a million registered sex offenders in the United States. One quarter of these million are minors, some as young as nine years old. In some states, registration is for life. There are tens of thousands of people on these registries for nonviolent offenses, such as public urination, indecent exposure, and taking photos of fully clothed children in public places. Yes, really. The U.S. Department of Justice shows that these registries have little impact on the rates of sexual offense recidivism, and that's why they should be changed dramatically. 
Marriage is ending because a wife objects to her husband's use of porn. Every therapist I know says the same thing, that cases of women divorcing men because of their porn use are increasing dramatically. As anti-porn organizations become better funded and erroneously conflate porn with domestic violence and rape, and as church groups and social media condemn porn use as infidelity, the needless suffering of women and men alike is also increasing as homes are broken up because of ideology and masturbation. Since divorce affects children as well, this is a family health crisis, not dad's porn use, but mom's insistence that dad's porn use has disqualified him from marriaging and parenting. And for anyone who says porn destroyed my marriage, my husband hasn't touched me in years, I'm very sympathetic. And I can confidently say that porn is not why your husband has lost interest in you sexually. We might as well mention some other issues around sexuality that are just as problematic as non-consent. For example, the number of teens who get arrested every year for sexting, the cynical mission creep in the definition of sex trafficking, which now includes porn actresses and sex workers, the epidemic of rapid onset gender dysphoria in college women, and the increase in entrapment cases in which police or vigilantes go to adult chat rooms, impersonate minors, and entice people who engage them in age role playing. While discussing sex with actual minors over the internet is illegal, it's legal with adults pretending to be minors. Of course, when you're busted for this legal activity, you have to convince a jury that you believed you were talking to an adult, which you were. Most jurors find the concept of age role play so repulsive or embarrassing if they do it themselves, that a conviction is almost guaranteed. Of course, resolving issues like these will not resolve the issue of consent. And on the other hand, resolving the issue of consent won't resolve any of these crucial issues that affect us and our loved ones every day. So consent, important. The only important thing? No, not the only important thing. I'm Dr. Marty Klein. Thanks for joining me. I publish one of these little uh, videos every other week. So if you like, push the subscribe button at the bottom of the screen and you'll uh, get a notice whenever I do one of these. Thanks a lot.